Okay, everyone, well, welcome back to the second plenary session of the um, PDD50 Transaction Symposium. And we have an exciting lineup of diverse talks um, to continue on and starting uh, with Professor John Rubenstein from Sick Children's Hospital, the University of Toronto, who will tell us about macromolecular machines at energized membranes. Welcome, John. Thanks so much, Natalie. And uh, so I'm really delighted to be here. It's it's funny to think that I'm speaking at a symposium for the anniversary of the PDB, considering that not too long ago, this is where we were in cryo-EM. And uh, this is a, my, my first cryo-EM structure, the culmination of my PhD and postdoctoral work in the UK um, at 32 angstroms resolution. And it's funny to think that just 10 years after this paper came out, people were starting to produce cryo-EM maps at sufficient resolution to build atomic models. And very satisfying too. So the, the biological theme of my laboratory are, is the membrane protein complexes that exist at energized membranes. The idea that a membrane could support an electrochemical gradient of ions was first proposed by Peter Mitchell in his chemiosmotic hypothesis. And to my mind, this is one of the few really paradigm changing ideas in biology. Because after this point, we could no longer think of cells as bags of enzymes, but instead they became uh, highly compartmentalized structures with interesting things going on like electric fields and ion gradients across membranes. The method that we use to study the macromolecular machines of these membranes is electron cryo microscopy, something I've been involved in working on for quite a long time, my entire career. And at the Hospital for Sick Children, we've established a really robust pipeline for determining high resolution structures. Uh, the pipeline is maintained by uh, Samir Benlekber, a former postdoc, now facility manager. And it really revolves around the original microscope that I got upon starting my own lab in 2006, uh, this 200 kilovolt field Michigan microscope, where we spend most of our effort in producing really optimized specimens. Once specimens have been fully optimized, only then do they go to a shared Titan Creos electron microscope, where we could, in the we can in the, in the course of a day or two, collect a large, high quality data set that we then use for our final image analysis, atomic uh, or map calculation, and atomic model building. And that from the, due to all the, the developments that have gone on in the past few years, from the time where we have an optimized specimen to the time where we're building our uh, high resolution, our, our atomic model is down to about two or three weeks often. So most of our effort really is over here in the biochemistry and the cryo specimen preparation. When Peter Mitchell first proposed the chemiosmotic hypothesis, he was thinking about it in the context of oxidative phosphorylation, the generation of ATP from ADP and phosphate. The ATP synthase generates ATP using the electrochemical gradient generated by the electron transport chain. NADH uh, and succinate produced in the citric acid cycle and fatty acid oxidation are oxidized and the free energy from that oxidation is used to pump protons from the mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space of the mitochondrion building up protomotive force. So the NADH is oxidized, the electrons are passed to quinone, reducing it to quinol, or succinate is oxidized to fumarate, again, reducing quinone to quinol. Quinol passes its electrons uh, to complex three, uh, which then passes electrons to cytochrome C, passes them to complex four, and finally, the terminal electron acceptor oxygen is reduced to water. And the passage of electrons through complex one, three, and four translocates the protons that powers the ATP synthase. Another enzyme that produces an energized membrane is the vacuolar type ATPase. And this is really a huge direction in my laboratory. And a lot, it's, it's a direction that's impossible for me to ignore because there's a huge amount of interplay between what we learn about VATPases and what we learn about the other intermembrane, uh, intrinsic membrane protein complexes of the electron transport chain. Heartbreakingly, I can't tell you too much about what we've done with VHPases, but I do want to give you a quick overview of some recent structures, uh, starting with the work of Jin Wazow, now, now at the Sanford Burnham uh, Research Institute in San Diego, where he was able to separate out the different conformations of the enzyme as it goes through its rotary catalytic cycle. Uh, the work of Mohammed Masab Jafari, uh, who was able to get our first high resolution structure of the membrane region of the VHPase, in fact, the first high resolution structure of the membrane region of any of these rotary HPases. And he did that by getting rid of the catalytic region and doing a high resolution cryo structure of just the membrane embedded region. 
uh, the work of Thamia Vasantha Kumar, a current graduate student who's been studying the uh, dynamics of the complex and looking at how lipids modulate its activity. And most recently, the work of Yazan Abbas, who used a trick that we developed in the lab to isolate the mammalian brain VHPAs to determine this first structure of a mammalian VHPAs. And what we've learned from these structures, the techniques we've developed have really informed our work on the other uh, membrane protein complexes we study. And in this talk, I'm going to really emphasize the ATP synthase. So what I want to tell you about primarily uh, is the eukaryotic ATP synthase structure and the bacterial ATP synthase structure, how that led us into studies of mycobacterial respiration and how we're looking at those structures in complex with important drugs like betaquiline and uh, important drug candidate, candidates like telasebec that are used to the target mycobacterial respiration to treat diseases like tuberculosis. So like the vacuolar type HPAs, the ATP synthase is a rotary HPAs. Whereas the vacuolar type HPAs hydrolyzes ATP to produce rotation of this blue rotor complex and pump protons, the ATP synthase carries out the opposite chemical reaction. It allows protons to go across the lipid bilayer driven by the electrochemical proton motive force. Uh, that translocation of protons causes the opposite direction of rotation of the central rotor, and that drives the synthesis of ATP in the catalytic region of the enzyme. And really, I, my lab had left the ATP synthase al alone until recent advances in cryo-EM prompted John Walker to call me up and say, we really have to start studying it again. He sent protein and a graduate student in the lab, Anna Zo, was able to obtain uh, these, this series of high resolution maps in collaboration with Nico Gregorius group and specifically Alexei Rohu, who's a postdoc there, accessing the Titan Creos microscope they had and we didn't have at, at the time. So Anna was able to produce these high resolution maps, not quite at the resolutions needed for atomic model building, but also she was able to separate out the different conformations of the enzyme. And now I'm showing you a cross section through the catalytic region so we could visualize the rotation of the rotor that drives the conformational changes that lead to ATP synthesis uh, at these catalytic interfaces. Now, ATP synthases in eukaryotes don't exist as these monomeric complexes. In fact, they form ribbons of dimers that we've known about really for quite a long time due to the work of Richard Allen at Vanderbilt University, but really elegantly demonstrated by Werner Kuhlbrandt's work on electron tomography. And here's some examples from Karen Davies, which is a postdoc in his lab. And from these 3D tomograms, we can see these ribbons of dimers, the same as what Richard Allen showed. Uh, but actually here you can see that they shape the mitochondrial cristae to give them the characteristic invaginations of mitochondrial inner membrane. So uh, another graduate student, a current graduate student in the group, Hui, Zou, uh, Hui Guo, was able to perform the same trick that we had done for the VHPAs uh, to look at just the membrane region of the complex, to remove the dynamics of the complex by getting rid of the catalytic region. And by using chemical dissociation of the catalytic region from the membrane region and using a very mild detergent, Hui was able to obtain this first structure of the membrane region of an ATP synthase. And because the catalytic region of the structure had been known for a very long time uh, due to John Walker's uh, Nobel Prize winning work, we were able to build this first atomic model of an intact ATP synthase, uh, in this case for the dimeric mitochondrial ATP synthase from the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The cryoEM field continued to progress and Hui was able to apply uh, new techniques in focused refinement to determine a structure of the bacterial ATP synthase, now no longer needing to separate the membrane region from the catalytic region, and instead uh, determining the entire high resolution structure at once simply by computationally focusing on one region and then the other region. Uh, and because he was not dissociating the complex, he could also observe the dynamics of the enzyme and separate out the different conformations that exist simultaneously in solution to visualize this rotary catalytic mechanism. This structure was hugely informative. Um, up until this point, we didn't have these this pair of structures, I should say, because up until this point, we didn't have any uh, chemical resolution insight into what was going on in the membrane regions of these HP synthases. We knew from uh, really ingenious speculation from Wolfgang Jungi and Stephen Vick uh, who, in the absence of any structural data, had postulated the mechanism by which an ATP synthase can convert transmembrane proton translocation into rotation. And the model from Jung and Vick was that protons go halfway across the lipid bilayer uh, through this green subunit. They bind to a conserved acidic residue in one of these ring forming subunits. And that neutralization of the acidic residue allows the ring to rotate so that the neutralized residue can enter the hydrophobic environment of the lipid bilayer. The rotation of the ring 
delivers a protonated acidic residue to a second offset half channel where the PKA drops, the proton is released and can go the rest of the way across the lipid bilayer. So with Hui's two structures, first from the uh, eukaryotic mitochondrion and then from the uh, bacterium, we were able to visualize the interaction of the ring with the green subunit and also visualize the path of protons where it um, goes through the halfway across the bilayer in order to bind to these uh, acidic residues and basically showed that uh, Jungi and Vic were absolutely correct in their remarkable speculation about how these machines could work. So now that we had the ability to determine high resolution structures for bacterial ATP synthases, we realized it was time to start looking at the process of oxidative phosphorylation in mycobacteria. Mycobacteria have quite a different electron transport chain than canonical mitochondria and bacteria. Their electron transport chain is quite branched. They have two different enzymes that can oxidize NADH and pass the electrons, in this case, not to ubiquinone, but to menaquinone. Uh, they have a similar uh, complex two that can oxidize succinate to fumarate. And, but instead of the complexes three and four that pass electrons between them with cytochrome C, they have an obligate super complex of complexes three and four with a cytochrome CC subunit. Another branch that exists for it to pass electrons to the terminal oxygen, uh, electron acceptor oxygen is the cytochrome BD complex. And so mycobacteria have this extremely complicated electron transport chain, but they still rely on um, the a mycobacterial ATP synthase to make ATP. They also have a number of enzymes that can feed in reduced uh, quinol or menaquinol at various points in this process. So the reason why mycobacterial oxidative phosphorylation is so interesting is that it's a drug target for treating TB. Mycobacteria, which uh, are pathogens for many human diseases like leprosy, uh, Beruli ulcer, and tuberculosis are strictly aerobic and drugs have been identified that will target respiration in mycobacteria. My, tuberculosis before uh, COVID-19 pandemic was the leading cause of death by infectious disease worldwide killing 1.4 million people in 2019, and even more worryingly, drug resistance is increasing in TB. And the drug that had been identified in 2005 and approved in 2012 was betaquilin, a mycobacterial ATP synthase inhibitor. Um, betaquilin was the first new TB drug in almost 50 years. And since it was approved in 2012, there has been one new additional approved TB drug, but a few promising uh, leads. Uh, MSF, uh, the organization, has estimated that betaquilin could be used to the benefit of 400,000 patients a year. So this is a very important therapeutic. It's on the WHO's list of essential medicines. So we decided that it was time to try to purify and determine the structure of the mycobacterial ATP synthase. And so in order to do that, uh, the first attempt that we tried, or really that Stephanie Bueller, my lab manager, tried, was to take the operon for the ATP synthase and express it in E. coli, much as we'd done for Hue Glow's structure of the Bacillus PS3 bacterial ATP synthase that he saw previously. And that sort of worked. It gave us a few particles uh, that we could see by negative stain. The yields were always really bad. Um, but it had a lot of problems. We couldn't increase the yield and the protein tended to aggregate terribly. In fact, below this uh, average is a really horrible looking aggregate. And this was an image that I generated for a grant application. So this was clearly not going to go very far, but it served its purpose because this image went in the grant application. The grant was successful at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, which if you know the CIHR, is no small feat. Uh, we got Stephanie a cake and we celebrated and we decided it was time to move on. Instead, what we did is talk to a colleague at the University of Toronto, June Liu, who's an expert in mycobacterial biology and genetics. And June suggested that we could tag, or we wanted to tag the endogenous mycobacterial AP synthase in M. smegmatis, but we didn't really know how until we talked to June. And he recommended this orbit protocol for introducing tags into the chromosomal DNA of the M. smegmatis. So Stephanie carried out an experiment, showed that she could purify the mycobacterial ATP synthase, and that worked really quite spectacularly. And it became the project for Hui, who was our resident expert in ATP synthase structures, and a new graduate student in the lab, uh, Gautier Crobon. So working very closely together, starting as Gautier's summer project, and then becoming his rotation project, and then his graduate project, Hui and Gautier were able to uh, get these beautiful high resolution micrographs of the endogenous mycobacterial ATP synthase solubilized with the detergent dodecyl maltoside. 
And with this preparation, they were able to produce this high resolution atomic model of the mycobacterial AP synthase at around 3.3 angstroms resolution. So first approximation, this structure does not look very different than other bacterial HP synthases. There are some differences in this peculiar B delta fusion, whereas most bacteria have two B subunits and a delta subunit. Mycobacteria have a fusion of one of their B subunits and the delta subunit. And there's some interesting differences there. But when you look at the uh, atomic model for the proton conducting subunit in the membrane and overlay it with Hui's previous atomic model, uh, for Bacillus PS3, and then a, an E. coli atomic model that came out subsequently, you can see there's really not much different that's going on. However, there is one quite surprising thing about this structure. So most ATP synthases need a way to prevent ATP hydrolysis. If the proton motive force collapses, ATP synthases can start running backwards, kind of like a proton pumping VHPAs. They'll start hydrolyzing ATP with their catalytic region and start pumping protons with their membrane region. And that leads to depletion of the cell supply of ATP. Uh, in humans, that depletion of ATP leads to ischemia, reperfusion injury, and stroke and heart attack. And in single cell organisms like bacteria and yeast, it would be devastating for the cell to lose its supply of ATP whenever the protein motor force transiently collapses. So all ATP synthases have some way of preventing ATP hydrolysis. And they seem to, this way of preventing ATP hydrolysis seems to vary from organism to organism. Preventing ATP hydrolysis in the absence of proton motor force, which occurs in the absence of oxygen often, is particularly important to mycobacteria because mycobacteria, uh, strictly aerobic pathogens, uh, experience phases of uh, hypoxia in the different compartments they uh, occupy within the people that they infect. And so this is thought to be a very important mechanism for mycobacterial survival. It's, a, it's predicted that about a quarter of the world's population harbors latent mycobacterial infections with these really dormant mycobacteria that are somehow not growing but resisting the hypoxic environments they survive in. So in Bacillus PS3, we could see that there was this uh, MOVE subunit that extends up into the catalytic region. And this subunit is known to prevent ATP hydrolysis in the absence of protomotive force. In Bacillus PS3, you can look at a cross section through the catalytic region, and you can see this subunit is positioned so that if the rotor were to try to turn in the direction of ATP hydrolysis, that subunit would be blocked, but in the direction of ATP synthesis, it could turn freely. That induces a conformational change and opens up the catalytic region for further rotation in the synthesis direction. The mycobacterial ATP synthase doesn't have that MOVE subunit sticking up into the catalytic region. It's down here in this down facing con uh, conformation. However, when we purify the mycobacterial ATP synthase, it doesn't have ATP hydrolysis activity. Instead, what we noticed was an, a really peculiar extension from these red subunits in the catalytic region that actually link the catalytic region to the central rotor and form this sort of hook-like uh, latch that prevents the, we think prevents the rotor from turning in the hydrolysis direction. So our model is that this extension of the alpha subunit is held kind of like a rope. So the rotor cannot turn in the hydrolysis direction, but you, while well, you can't pull a rope or stretch a rope, you can push a rope. And so the rotor can turn in the synthesis direction. And in fact, we also observed a very scarce uh, conformation in some of the particle images where the, that extension was bent back on itself. And then we imagine that the rotor continues to turn and is fully and fully releases that extension so that AP synthesis can occur. So we could do molecular genetics. We could introduce the tag to truncate that extension and show that when you truncate the extension, you do indeed return ATP hydrolysis activity to the mycobacterial ATP synthase. So our model looks like this, where the extension binds the central rotor. And in the absence of a protomotive force, the rotor turns backwards with one click in the hydrolysis direction, but can't turn any further. When the protomotive force resumes, it can start to turn in the synthesis direction that extension is released and the ATP synthase can go on and happily produce ATP. The drug betaquiline is known to inhibit ATP synthesis and it's known to interact with the C subunit, that ring forming subunit of the ATP synthase. And it's, it inhibits ATP synthesis with nanomolar concentrations. In our new, uh, new strain of mycobacterial ATP synthase where we can actually see ATP hydrolysis activity, betaquiline also inhibits ATP hydrolysis with nanomolar activity. But paradoxically, when people have measured the affinity of betaquilin for the presumed target, the C subunit, it's only been measured at micromolar affinity. So we thought that perhaps the reason it's only at micromolar affinity is because the binding also involves other subunits. And in fact, we could determine the structure of the mycobacterial ATP synthase with betaquilin bound, 
we can see three different types of sites. One that just involves the C subunit as had been crystallized previously. And then two sites where there's a much deeper binding pocket for the drug at the interface of the green subunit and that C ring. And we think those are actually the tight binding sites because if we take, compare the drug saturated structure to the drug free structure, and then take the protein and wash away any loosely bound drug, we could see that the drug preferentially stays bound at the, in, at the interfaces that involve this green subunit and gets washed away quite readily from the interfaces that are just at these C subunits. So we think that these are actually the important uh, binding sites for the nanomolar activity of the drug. So our model for how betoclin inhibits the mycobacterial apisynthase looks like this, where uh, the enzyme will actually go through a massive conformational change in order to produce these binding sites at the interfaces of the green subunit and the ring. And amazingly, that conformational change not only produces one binding site, it produces another binding site at the other side that's just the right amount of rotation to create two equivalent binding sites or two different binding sites that are both optimal for this one drug molecule. Now, the AP synthase isn't the only protein complex targeted a minute by or so, John. drugs. But pardon me? Just, just a minute. So. Okay, yeah, I'm just about there. Uh, in fact, our for first foray into mycobacterial respiration was with my friend and collaborator, Peter Brzezinski, looking at the respiratory super complex. This is a fascinating machine that I can't explain in detail, but one of the ways it produces a protomotive force is by oxidizing uh, menaquinol at one site, releasing protons from one side of the lipid bilayer, reducing menaquinol at another site, picking up protons from the other side of the lipid bilayer. And the drug telasabec, or the drug candidate telasabec, is proposed to interfere with that process. This is one of the first new compounds with proven anti-TB activity in humans. And uh, two students, or a student, David Yanofsky, and a postdoc, Justin Bitrani, have been able to show in collaborator with, co collaboration with Peter Brzezinski that we get this uh, sub-micromolar inhibition, and we've also been able to determine structures, first showing endogenous menaquinol in the uh, site where menaquinol is oxidized, and then also showing the drug candidate telasabec blocking that site and blocking the dynamics that we, are, we believe are important for menaquinol oxidation in the activity of the mycobacterial respiratory supercomplex. So there are lots of interesting directions in the lab. We'll continue to look at mycobacterial respiration and TB drugs. In order to understand that, we want to understand the eukaryotic electron transport chain. And of course, uh, vacuolar ATPase assembly and regulation are a major direction with cryo-EM method development underlying all of these activities. I've already told the names of uh, many of the people who've done the work. The group is much bigger than it has usually been, but a lot of people are leaving for various postdocs and faculty positions and med school and law school. And so there actually are positions in the lab if people are interested in joining. So I'll stop there and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, John, for this fabulous talk. And uh, if you would like to ask a question either in the chat or to uh, just unmute and, and ask away. I, I'll start with, um, in terms of uh, betaquiline resistance, what do we know about mutations and do any of them map to these regions and to the various sites that you talked about? Absolutely. So the, the way that the C subunit, the membrane ring forming subunit was identified as the binding site was through generation of mutations uh, at Jensen Pharmaceuticals where the drug was discovered. And uh, so that's a in, in the laboratory resistance mutation. Um, those mutations in the same subunits have been identified in humans in resistance to betaquilin. So betaquilin is not going to be a silver bullet. It's used to treat multi-drug resistant and extensively drug resistant TB. It's ex an extremely important drug. It revolutionizes treatment of those uh, two conditions. Uh, but resistance to this drug is also possible. Um, so it's uh, we need we need more molecules because resistance will come. Um, someone. Uh, Ethan Kerr uh, Tenya asks, do you think that if approved telebac telesabic <laughs> will become more effective than betaquiline against TB? So there's actually a problem with telesabic and that is that it inhibits the, uh, the mycobacterial. So I, I, I showed you that there are actually two uh, branches to the uh, mycobacterial respiratory chain. That was a good example. So you can reduce oxygen to uh, water with the respiratory super complex it's targeted by telasabac or with cytochrome BD. And so if you think about the bioenergetics, 
inhibiting this complex is probably not going to be a, an outstanding drug. So I don't think it's going to be the best drug. And there's been some evidence that it's, it's not going to be the best drug. It is only one of a few, three or four molecules that have proven anti-TB activity in humans. Um, but I, I think that a much better strategy would be to inhibit both the cytochrome BD branch and mycobacterial respiratory supercomplex branch simultaneously. Um, so I, I think we need to think more in a more sophisticated way when we think about targeting mycobacterial respiration. But we have that, we understand these processes, so this will be a useful, useful tool. And Lisa Katorcha has um, one last quick question. John, which technique, in your opinion, will bring us to molecular movies of the ATPase, cryem and liposome? So that's definitely something of interest to uh, to my my lab and things that we are working on. I would argue that we can already get some molecular movies because uh, the process of ATP synthesis and ATP hydrolysis are symmetrically related. So we can actually look at the process of ATP hydrolysis already and see the molecular motions that are, are going on. But certainly the dream is to look at uh, membrane protein complexes in lipid bilayers. Uh, and that's, that's certainly like you, uh, that's the direction in which we're thinking at the moment.